before I hand things over is I want to take a moment to thank Tin Mountains Nature Program Series sponsors. Um, and they are um, White Mountain Oil and Propane, um, Hancock Lumber, and Farm to Table Market in West Ossipi. Um, and so I want to just recognize them for their financial support that allow us to put on quality programming such as this. Um, and I also want to thank all of you who are watching um, this evening or whenever you're watching this, uh, who are current members of Tin Mountain Conservation Center. Thank you so much for your support because your membership dollars um, also go towards helping us fulfill our mission, which includes putting on um, quality programming such as this. So thank you. Um, and if you're not a member of Tin Mountain, we would certainly encourage you to consider um, consider doing so. And there's information um, about that on our website at tinmountain.org. Um, but you know, we're here to, to learn about vernal pools and vernal pool ecology. And there is no one better than Dr. Rick Vanderpoel, who is Tin Mountain's, uh, you know, Tin Mountain's research director. Um, as I hand things over to him, the, the one last housekeeping note that I will say is if you have questions or comments during the program, the best way um, to ask those is to type them directly into the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I will be monitoring that. And if it's an immediate clarifying question, I will um, hop in and, um, and ask that of, um, ask that of Rick um, as he's transitioning slides. Um, otherwise, we will hold question and answer um, till the end. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Rick. Okay, thanks, Nora, appreciate it. And I uh, always do a great job organizing these nature programs. It's a delight for me to be here and I welcome everybody to this uh, online uh, seminar on vernal pools. And hopefully many of you I can I will see on Saturday at Green Mountain Conservation Group's headquarters on Huntress Bridge Road in Effingham. And again, Nora will put up the uh, link to contact uh, their staff person, Tyra Schroeder, who will be organizing that event for GMCG. But I have, um, and I have a, a story to tell about that. So at the end of the slideshow, um, I'll show you a few pictures, uh, previews as it were of coming attractions. Well, you have chosen wisely in terms of a year to learn about vernal pools. That's all I can say. And, and if that's all I say, <laughs> You can turn off your video and camera now and go home or you are home <laughs> because this is the year that was. We have had more movement, more animals and more success in our vernal pools. And it all has to do with basically one thing and that's of course water. Not unlike 2003, 2011, 2000 and I'm testing you now, 17 and there was another year in the last decade where we had unbelievable rainfall in the spring and allowed for that in migration to the vernal pools by salamanders and frogs and a variety of other creatures, uh, some of which I will talk about tonight. Uh, but just to give you an example um, and how variable it can be, our big night here in the Mount Washington Valley um, was documented by none other than our research staff, Katie Lewis and our avian intern, Logan Anderson, among other folks. I don't know if any of you were out on that night with them, but they recorded nine redback salamanders, one Northern Dusky salamander, which is unusual for a road crossing uh, salamander. Uh, three spotted and two wood frogs with a bunch of peepers next to the pool at the Nature Learning Center. Uh, and then Deb Marnich, who currently works at Chicago Lake Conservancy, recorded a few more animals in Glen that night, 30 spotted salamanders, 10 peepers, one wood frog, eight redbacks, and one toad. And of course, toads generally come out a little later, so you don't always see them on the early side of things. And if you think that was, uh, a relatively good showing. Let me re review the numbers from <laughs> not just what uh, 
they call, they're calling the big night, they're calling it the epic night in Southern New Hampshire on May 31st. Ready for this? 4,570 amphibians. <laughs> and those were live amphibians. They're actually a, a part of this big night salamander crossing brigade, brigade that the Harris Center organizes. They had 502 raid, road kills in 30 sites. And that was included 2,716 spring papers, 1,217 wood frogs, 438 salaman spotted salamanders, and 54 four toed salamanders, which is also an uncommon sight on some of these road crossing nights. Um, but nonetheless, uh, in southern New Hampshire, is fairly well represented. We used to think four toads, for example, were kind of rare. Uh, we know better now after having spent the time counting them. In any case, that was. Uh, just over four hours on one night capturing or recording 4,500 <laughs> amphibians. So these, the movement this year has been epic and uh, will continue to be so. And therefore, any vernal pool, and we'll talk about that shortly in the slideshow, that you visit at this point in time from now until when they dry up, you'll be able to see evidence of some of these salamanders and frogs that have moved into the pools. All right, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, uh, share my screen and uh, we'll, we'll get started. And let's just see, how's that? Good, excellent. So again, this is uh, a, one of our nature programs for, for Tin Mountain. I've uh, given a talk like this several times before. Uh, I modify it every year. So if you didn't come last year, it's a little different. <laughs> and I'll also, as I said, I have stories of the Green Mountain Conservation uh, uh, Headquarters uh, Vernal Pool. So first, what is it? Uh, Generally, these are temporary surface waters, right? They're, they inundate in the wintertime and they dry up in the spring and summer, or late spring, I should say, in summer. Some of them don't dry up at all, and that's where it gets kind of tricky. Permanent or is it ephemeral? Well, you can have permanent water bodies effectively be a vernal pool. The problem is you end up getting some other critters in there that might disrupt the, the actual definition of it. We'll talk about what the, the tight definition is of a vernal pool. And here it is. The state of New Hampshire defines it as a surface water or wetland. So that might include a forested swamp, for example, uh, that is not intentionally created for compensatory mitigation or maybe uh, that has breeding habitat for amphibians and invertebrates. All right, now that's a long definition. I'm not gonna go through all the gory details of it, but the, the typical characteristics include this winter spring cycling of water in a defined depression or a basin, which might be, like I say, a forested swamp or even a scrub shrub swamp. It doesn't typically have a flowing outlet, although in the springtime, if the water is high, like it is this week, uh, you could have some overflow from an outlet that then dries up and provides that isolation uh, characteristic in the summertime. It typically has water for more than 60 days. And that is timed according to the amount, the average amount of time that it takes for one of the primary indicator species, the spotted salamander, to actually lay eggs, have the eggs hatch, and then develop into viable terrestrial air breathing miniature juveniles. And that it takes about 60 to 65 days for that to happen. So that's why we generally say that a vernal pool has to have 60 days of inundation. And then typically it doesn't have a fish population, right? Now that again is somewhat uh, subject to site conditions. And that's where I was saying before, you can have an ephemeral water body, but if it's perennial, that is to say it has water all year long, you may end up getting some of these invertebrates and vertebrates like fish, that would disqualify it from being an actual vertical pool according to the state definition. Why are they important? Well, there's lots of reasons. And this is why we've spent more and more time. I started learning about vernal pools actually in the 1980s. I was kind of late to the game. 
Um, and even at that time, the state didn't have a tight definition and we were still sort of figuring out why they're important, but we've since come to learn that these are critical uh, aspects of any landscape that provides a number of uh, not just breeding conditions for amphibians, but also stopover sites for migratory birds, for a, a variety of different turtles that use vernal pools in the spring for feeding. Um, and it also provides a food source for a lot of our terrestrial uh, vertebrates like raccoons and skunks and mink and so forth. So they have this wildlife habitat and aquatic life support uh, um, function that is really, really critical. They also, in a localized, uh, on a localized basis, uh, recharge groundwater, both in, typically into a bedrock aquifer, but occasionally they'll have floodplain vernal pools along a big river, and those are recharging groundwater right into a stratified drift or, or sand and gravel aquifer. You also have this sort of movement of biomass into and out of a pool and typically the pools produce more than they absorb. So it's an export condition, which is a positive thing, of course, in the energetics of any ecosystem. Uh, some rare species occur in vernal pools. I'll talk about a couple of them in a minute. And so they do serve as endangered species habitat. And of course they provide some of the aesthetic qualities that uh, people enjoy in their backyards. Um, the biodiversity value is, as I said before, very significant. And it's not just on a, a species and interspecies level, it's also on an infra species level. And that's where that term metapopulation comes into play, right? A metapopulation is a collection of a bunch of different smaller populations. And if they get isolated, then one or two things can happen. One, the population will die out from inbreeding because there's no import of other genetic material, or they can stagnate and develop over a long period of time different uh, evolutionary characteristics that might actually create different species, which is how some of our new, newer salamander species that are being named uh, came about. So that metapopulation stuff is important for on a genetic level, and that will also be talked about a little bit more as we get into the, the different uh, critters. And notice uh, the genetic neighborhood, the size of some of these. Um, you think a wood frog, well, it just has to go into vernal pool. Not so. Its home range is over 5,000 hectares, uh, or can be, in terms of how it far it will disperse out of a vernal pool once it's uh, grown into an adult, or I should say a juvenile, and then further into an adult. So uh, you've got these huge home ranges for some of our species that visit Myrtle pools. So that's another aspect that makes these guys really important. Uh, it, physically, they're generally pretty shallow. Um, I generally don't have a hard time getting through a pool in hip waders. Um, every so often I need chest waders and then every so often I, that doesn't even work either, um, but generally less than a meter deep. So they're shallow and that allows for that um, uh, drying out in the summertime and the water, you know, drops out and uh, allows it to be isolated from other surface waters, uh, which is critical for these inbreeding uh, amphibians. Their watersheds are pretty small, and that's a, uh, an important aspect of a vernal pool. We'll talk more about that under the conservation section. And typically they're sitting above some type of hard pan that allows for the water to stay at the surface for a period of time. That hard pan most commonly in our area is bedrock, um, and yet there are cracks in the bedrock and as well, of course, in the summertime, the evapotranspiration and evaporation of the water allows it to drain out. But in other situations, you might have a compact uh, silt layer or, or clay silt layer as you have in floodplains. And that provides that perching, as they say, that keeps the water at the surface. So what are our primary indicators? Um, we basically have three different, in our area, three different vertebrates and one invertebrate. 
And the vertebrates include the spotted salamander in our area, or if you're in southern New Hampshire, marbled salamander, the Jefferson blue spot complex, and we'll talk more about that, um, the wood frog, and then the invertebrate is represented by fairy shrimp. So let's talk about the first on the scene in a typical spring is the wood frog. Um, this is on, on the left. There's a, a nice male wood frog, has a slight, slightly pinkish tinge to it, unlike the females. And they tend to be a little smaller, about uh, three quarters the size of a female. And they lay these globular, roughly grapefruit sized clusters of eggs, as you can see um, in this middle picture. And typically the clusters are aggregated into groups. And as much as we like to count different egg clusters as an indicator of, of, of success or abundance of, of given species, it's pretty tough to count wood frog egg clusters. Uh, I try it every year and it's a rough guess because as you can see, they come into this sort of amorphous mass when they're laid. Within 10 days, and this year it was a little longer because of how cool it was uh, after April 17th when our big night was, uh, it took roughly 12 to 13 or 14 days for these little tadpoles to emerge from the egg masses and start aggregating on the sides of the pool where the water temperatures are warmer. Uh, this nice maple leaf here offsets a very dark individual which can be mistaken for a toad. Uh, toad uh, larvae are very similar, but they're jet black, whereas the wood frog is pretty much a dark brown. There are other features too to separate these tadpoles, but these are really the first ones that will emerge. So if you've got tadpoles at this time of year, more than likely it's wood frog, okay? Again, keep in mind the salamanders take upwards of 60 days to hatch out of their eggs. So they're not gonna really come around until early June, sometimes the end of, of May, but more likely early June. So wood frog is our, uh, our number one uh, earliest uh, species to arrive. And very often uh, we hear them, their wood duck-like quack in the woods on these somewhat warm days. And it gets above 45 or 50 degrees. Uh, you'll hear the quacking taking place uh, both nearby or in a vernal pool. Um, our wood frogs, in, uh, I live in Sandwich, uh, moved on a dry night when there was high humidity but warm temperatures. And that was pretty much it. It was a singular movement of wood frogs. I, and that's not uncommon for this species. You'll have one shot. <laughs> Every so often you'll get some other nights you know, a second night, but typically if you see wood frogs on a road on a second or third night, they're moving out of the pool and they've already done their business in the pool itself. So here's the spotted salamander. This is, I'm sure, very familiar to many of you. Um, I found another one in my basement <laughs> about two weeks ago. Um, and um, yeah, it, it's, they do move into these dark, places, sometimes into your window wells or your basements if they can get there. And so they're very common on the landscape. You see them certainly in vernal pools when they're breeding, but they do scatter as the uh, slide before indicated upwards of a mile away, mile and a quarter away uh, from their natal breeding site. So you can find these guys uh, throughout the woods and when they're away from the vernal pools, of course, they're typically in sort of a estivation state of, of dormancy. And you might roll over a log by accident somewhere, or if you have a wood pile and there's an old piece of wood on the bottom, you lift it up, you might find these guys uh, in the woods as you travel about. But it's really the spring, this time of year, when they move into the pools, they become very evident and they lay these globular, egg masses that are also fairly light in color, uh, but they have a distinguishing characteristic that separates them wood from wood frog. And that is that every, wood, every cluster of eggs is surrounded by a gelatinous sheath. 
And uh, you can sort of see that in the middle slide. It's kind of a whitish, but almost clear sheath around it. And then as the eggs mature into the later spring and they start, uh, um, you know, the embryos are getting larger and the algae begins to grow between the egg cells themselves, you can see that gelatinous sheath surrounding all of the individual eggs. Whereas in a wood frog, each egg has its own sheath, but there's no overall sheath, over uh, size sheath around the entire egg mass. So spotted salamanders are uh, kind of fun in the way that they're unique. You can take a picture of something, a, an individual like this, and there will be no other individual with an exact same spot pattern. So it's kind of neat, you can, if you've got a pool in your backyard, you can take pictures of these guys and then see if they come back. And more than likely they will. Keep in mind that these guys live upwards of 25 years, right? Now, I bet you didn't know that. Uh, maybe some of you did. And if there's, unless there's some kind of, uh, well, in this case, a rainbow trout, uh, excuse me, a, a Eastern brook trout that is consuming eggs or some type of caddis fly or, maybe some uh, water mold that's killing the eggs, these guys will uh, imprint their natal uh, location on their offspring so that their offspring will also come back to that pool. And if you think about it, they had better be 25 years old or more because the mortality rate of offspring in these guys are, is pretty high. So you need to have that's one reason. And another is it takes them between seven and nine years to fully develop into an egg laying adult. The females are a little bit different. Uh, I don't have a male to compare, but this is a female depicted right here. And you can tell because the tail is fairly long, it's stubby. Um, and then if I were to flip it over, you would see a swollen cloaca, which is where the eggs uh, are going to be extruded. Um, but this is a typical spotted, and like I said, every so often they will try their best to get into a fish pond and lay eggs, and some of them survive and some of them come back. But this would not be defined as a vernal pool because of the presence of this uh, brook trout. All right. So the next species that is the sort of third most common species we have that's an obligate or primary indicator is this Jefferson's blue spot, spotted salamander complex. It's also in the Ambistomidae, which is called a mole salamander, largely because they are fossorial or underground most of the year. Uh, and it shares many of the characteristics of the spotted salamander, but look at the difference in the size of the egg cluster. First and foremost, it's fairly small. Um, secondly, you'll see that when the eggs are laid on an attachment site, it's kind of linear. And this is actually a fairly large egg mass for a blue spot. Uh, they have eggs that they say range from about 50 to 250 per, per cluster. Uh, my experience is that it's been more like 60 to 75 per cluster. And that's one of the ways that you can tell a, a Jefferson's blue spot complex from a spotted salamander. Another way is, which is why I've got these eggs in my hand, is that if you lift them gently out of the, off the surface of the pool, the egg cluster will sort of flatten out in your hand. It won't be as, as turgid, or if that's a good word, <laughs> turgid and stiff. It will actually flatten out a little bit. And that's between the size and the shape and how uh, firm it is in your hand, that's a good way to tell them apart. And very often that's the only thing you've got because the salamanders are either long gone or uh, they've hidden themselves down in the, in the muck in the bottom of the pool and you can't find them so easily. But on the left here is the blue spotted salamander. You can see uh, a fairly dark individual with silvery blue flecking throughout the back and the sides and on the feet. And this one conforms at least morphologically to the blue spotted. Whereas if I had a picture of a Jefferson salamander and I should have put one in, they're more grayish. Uh, 
the trick is, and this is the, I think one of the most fascinating stories in vertebrate ecology, is that they hybridize and form polyploid individuals that carry the genetic material of both species. And that is the dominant case. So you may think that this guy on the left is a blue spotted, but it may actually have some Jefferson salamander genes in it. And you can't really tell that unless you do a DNA analysis. Further, which is I think part of the cool part of this story that I learned now 40 years ago from Tom Tiny, is that they developed an ability to asexually reproduce. So that especially the polyploid females will get, lay eggs that turn into more polyploid females. And they're clonal, but they can do so without being inseminated by the males. And that is, again, a long-term evolutionary advantage for isolation in these different metapopulations of the species. And when I say species, I mean species complex, right? So that's, that's even a cooler story because it, it gives these guys a, an advantage that they otherwise wouldn't have. My God, I got to wait around for a guy and the guy's not around. The guy's not going to be here for 10 years. What the heck, you know? <laughs> so why not develop this ability to reproduce clonally and keep that genetic um, uh, uh, polyploidy going? So it's a neat species. And this guy, the blue spotted Jeffersons are listed species. They're not common in, in New Hampshire. Uh, I've seen a couple of them in Effingham. I've seen some in Madison. Uh, I'm not sure if I've ever found any in Conway or Albany yet. Perhaps one of you has, and you can report in the chat that you have. Uh, but they are more common in Southern New Hampshire. And when you get to Southwestern New Hampshire, uh, you have a much higher likelihood of finding a true Jefferson's salamander, which again, a little bit larger and all gray without the blue spots. All right, so that's our third one. And then our fourth uh, one, which is also Ambistomidae, the family of mole salamanders, but which we only have in very Southern New Hampshire. In fact, it's only known from two isolated vernal pools in, in Hollis is the marbled salamander. And I took uh, this picture uh, on the right here of an individual, I think that was in Tennessee, if I'm not mistaken. And the other picture came from the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program, just to give you an idea of how different the marbled salamander looks. Plus you've got a nice advantage of seeing eggs with the salamander and notice that these eggs are above the surface of the pool. And that is, also a cool thing because these guys lay their eggs in the fall. They count on winter rains to survive. So you get these egg laying events on usually a warm rainy night in October, sometimes as late as November, and they can be exposed to the air, but they're counting on the fact these pools will fill up in the wintertime and retain enough moisture in the spring for the eggs to hatch, the larvae develop, and the larvae then to do their own um, uh, emergence from the pool uh, in late spring. So marbled salamander, very different uh, organism in that sense, and a state endangered uh, species for us in New Hampshire because it's so rare in our state. Much more common in the Ohio Valley and the middle Atlantic states. All right, so last and not, but not least in terms of our primary indicator is our lone invertebrate that uh, sort of serves the purpose of, of you know, uh, as an icon of vernal pool habitats and that's the fairy shrimp. And just to give you a size reference, this is a mosquito larva on the right-hand side and up here on the upper left, and the fairy shrimp isn't a whole lot bigger, right? So these are small, they're, they're pretty tiny. And yet they have this incredible affinity for vernal pools. And I must say they are incredibly abundant when they're, when they're present and they're extremely hard to find when they're not. <laughs> and I'll give you an example of that by demonstrating um, this, vernal pool 
fairy shrimp video, which a friend of mine took um, just to show you what these guys look like in the water. And if you can see them, they're all kind of here at the bottom. And it, you'll, there's a little bit of a, uh, yeah, we got to adjust it a little bit, the camera a little bit. But this gives you a better look at, they're on their backs and they're filtering microorganisms through these decapod filters, right? These are their feet that have a fimbriate or hair, hair margin to it. And they move through a sequence of moving these uh, decapods upwards. They move that collected material towards their mouth parts. So fairy shrimp in a pool, and I think this was uh, in Raymond, New Hampshire. Pretty neat stuff. We've got some fairy shrimp around the Mount Washington Valley, but they're, again, they're pretty uncommon. Uh, they're more common further south and coastally. Um, we've got a couple of different species, and this one, Eubrancopus vernalis, is our most common one, which you can tell by the shape and size of the caudal appendages. Okay, so uh, I want you to commit the following slide to memory. Uh, <laughs> I'll test you on it later. <laughs> okay, secondary indicators. Oh uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there that has to, let me show you some pictures of what these guys are, shall I? All right, secondary indicator. Now in this case, to confirm a vernal pool in the state of New Hampshire, you have to have three of these. And it's really actually not too hard to find three different aquatic invertebrates in this group. Predaceous diving beetles, which is this middle slide, yeah, they're fairly common. You may see them as our little toe biters, as we called them when I was growing up, uh, in the larval state. But as an adult, they're pretty big. You know, they're upwards of an inch long, uh, some of them. And so they're, they're not that uncommon, especially in vernal pools. Um, then you have on the right here, these caddis flies. Um, this is one of the many stick case caddis fly makers. And this one has sort of the log cabin arrangement, what I call the log cabin caddis fly. Uh, there's actually a couple of genera that do this. Anabolia is the one I'm illustrating. And then we've got another caddis fly that makes these long stick-like uh, cases. Uh, this is the Pycnopsyche. Uh, genus, and they're very common, but they also occur in streams. <laughs> so you don't forget, you might have these guys present, but you might also not be in a vernal pool. So don't, you, you yes, yeah, secondary indicators are important, but you also have to have those other characteristics that I mentioned at the beginning of the slide, you know, the 60 days, the isolated basin, et cetera. And then dragonfly larvae. These guys are darners, and they're also a regular uh, occupant of vernal pools. We have a few more. Uh, a giant tube maker on the left here, that's um, in the Virginia uh, genus. And these guys are actual predators on uh, mole salamander eggs, which kind of makes it interesting and also very easy to find when these guys are attached to the egg cluster and you see them sticking out. And that's like a two or three inch long tube that they make, so they're giant. They're our biggest caddis fly. Um, you've got a couple of others here. You've got some snails. This is just one of the many snails that we find in salamanders, a couple of different dragonflies. This is actually a damselfly group in the Ceniagrinidae. And then you've got uh, some diving, uh, or excuse me, some scavenger beetles in the hy hydrophilidae. So you've got a, a several different options in terms of uh, secondary indicators. The groups in general are listed here, the worms, the leeches, pill clams, snails, et cetera. And uh, a lot of these guys um, are mostly, well, most of these guys are facultative. That is to say they could occur in a vernal pool, but they don't have to occur in a vernal pool. Um, some of the worms are pretty fascinating. And I can tell you that, you know, it's like anything, if you dive in, and you start to discover the different organisms in a vernal pool, you'll see how rich and abundant they are in spite of their dryness and what, how dead they look in the summertime. So, okay, just a few more uh, organisms. And keep in mind that uh, 
this is a water-based uh, occurrence, so a lot of these critters are living there temporarily. They're counting on that drying out and they will emerge from their larval state or pupal state um, and emerge as adults from the pools themselves and become things like dragonflies, et cetera. So, um, you know, aquatic resources, notwithstanding, vernal pools are ranked very, very highly you know, functionally. And then, of course, we have a few other uh, facultative organisms. I mentioned toads before. Uh, snapping turtles can be found in vernal pools. Uh, these red spotted newts, which tend to like, uh, this is the adult stage or the aquatic stage of the red spotted newt. Um, they tend to like permanent waters like ponds and lake edges, but they can occur in vernal pools. Uh, the tree frog, uh, this is um, our common gray tree frog. Some of our other frogs like green frogs and pickerel frogs will occur. Um, bullfrogs, as you can see in the tadpole soup here, uh, and, and one being kissed by um, a, a hopeful seventh grader who was, well, I don't think the prince showed up that, that day, but she was hopeful. And of course, we got some bobcat tracks just to add some flavor in the wintertime. So we've got two different primary uh, pools, a little bit more of the ecology. We've got ones in the upland woodland areas, the woodland pools, and then those that are in the floodplains. And both are similar in that they have these, you know, primary and secondary indicators, but the materials that perch them are different and their role in sort of the ecology of these parts of the state are different. And that's why um, they're, they're often separated out. Functionally, the vernal floodplain pools, for example, don't have much wood in them. That wood gets washed away in the high waters of spring every year, right? So the attachment sites are very sparse. Um, functionally, vernal floodplain pools often have fish in them because fish get washed in. They don't survive, but they get washed in. So they get, there's an additional predatory pressure on floodplains. So there's a bunch of differences like that that are, I think, important to take note of. So let's look at a couple of different types. Uh, let's see what we're doing here, good time. Um, and this is just some various vernal pools in, in the landscapes of New Hampshire. Uh, this one was in a conifer swamp in Dublin and you know not what you would associate to be a vernal pool yet right in this open water area were some spotted salamander eggs. And this thing dries up in the spring, uh, late spring, summer, so it, served, you know, it met the definition of being a vernal pool, even though it's the edge of this fairly extensive swamp. Here's one that's more of a classic pool in Grantham, and that entire thing uh, dries out. Um, you can see that uh, the pine tree in the middle there has died. Uh, that pine tree uh, obviously couldn't take as much water as was given it. <laughs> Um, and you have to actually wonder how it got there to begin with, but most, most likely it started growing on a mound from an old tree tip up. And as that mound decomposed, the roots got deeper and deeper into the water. And it's sort of, you know, and that was sort of the death knell. Here's one that was in Dublin that uh, I recorded in 1991. Um, and that particular year, the beavers came up and flooded an otherwise, you know, seasonally saturated flooded swamp. And in that particular year, in the very first year that the beavers flooded this and the trees started to die, I counted about 10,000 wood frog egg masses which, I mean, that's a round number, but I give you the idea that it was a lot of root frogs. And then <clears throat> in a matter of 20 years, it looked like this. This is the same view of this same pond. It's a little slightly different. I'm looking a little bit down into the pool, but all those trees died and it became effectively a marsh. And there were still spotted salamanders laying their eggs in this uh, pond but the wood frogs were, were gone. There were no wood frogs to be seen. So things change over time. And that's one of the 
ideas I wanted to get across in terms of the variable types of vernal pools. This isolated pool is part of a kettle hole pond. And there's the isolated portion. It's not connected to this kettle hole pond in uh, Center Harbor. And yet this pool will had enough uh, water and pH to support spotted salamanders. I didn't stick around to see if they survived, but nonetheless, it, it met the criteria. This one is in a floodplain. So we have a stream system that floods and comes through this pool. And then as the stream water uh, drops in the springtime, the pool becomes isolated. And this one had not only um, wood frog, or excuse me, spotted salamander, it also had blue spotted salamander eggs in it as well. And Peterborough, again, in the southern part of the state, a little bit more apt to see blue spots. This one's in Hanover, and this one um, was just barely deep enough. I could walk right through that pool and, and, and not sink in at all because it had a clay silt bottom. Uh, it was probably about 12 inches deep at the de deepest part. And yet it was just enough for wood frogs to lay their eggs in. Generally, I look for 10 inches or more on the average high water for wood frog and about 14 inches deep or more for spotted salamanders. And then of course you have some created uh, pools that occasionally serve the purpose. This one, also in Peterborough, um, had both a spotted and blue spotted salamander eggs in it. And that was all good and well. And then somehow, no surprise, mallards probably landed in there with some fish eggs on their feet. And then the pumpkin seed sunfish took off and <laughs> that was sort of the end of that. Um, those eggs didn't really survive afterwards. But for a long time, that was built in the 60s, uh, for about 30 years, it was served as a vernal pool. Then every so often you get these accidental so-called vernal pools, old gravel pits, excavations. And what typically happens is that, you know, things go south pretty quickly. You might have some action in the first year, like we saw in the Rookery Pond in Dublin, where wood frogs come in. But if they're inappropriately, uh, if, the, if the hydrology is insufficient, as is often the case in these excavated uh, uh, depressions, you'll have plants come in like cattails, you'll have duckweed respond to the warm water temperatures, that will cover the surface. And then of course, algae proliferates thereafter. And when that dies, it creates hypoxic conditions. The fish die, the aquatic life is stressed or they die. And then you get some invasive plants in and it really doesn't function as a vernal pool. So it's, you may think it's easy to create a vernal pool, but uh, it's really not that easy. And of course, sometimes you have these, what I call uh, vernal pool traps <laughs> that are, created in this case by a cul-de-sac with a circle around a swamp. I don't know how they got permitted to do that, but it had wood frogs and spotted salamanders in there that I'm sure did not survive. You know, it's not just being on a roadside, but there's no shade to keep the temperatures down. So I'm sure there was an, a hypoxic die off of whatever, you know, eggs were laid in there. Uh, then of course you have the classic, you know, skitter rut in the woods and uh, these also present a problem. Um, they are present in somebody's route on their way to a, you know, a perfectly good vernal pool and they figure, oh, I'm gonna stop here. Why well, go to the good pool? I'll lay my eggs in here. And then of course, as the summer progresses, things get really hot, the temperature incre increases, Bacteria and algae come in just like in those other created pools and the larvae die. So they, they effectively act as a trap <laughs> for incoming or out migrating um, salamanders and frogs. And I've seen a lot of those in the woods. But sometimes you get lucky. And this is what we're gonna take a look at um, at Green Mountain uh, Conservation uh, Headquarters uh, in Effingham on Saturday morning. Um, we had a building that came up uh, that was available and some, some land 
to be purchased for the new headquarters that was uh, back in 2015. And uh, right outside the door was this forested swamp. And I got the question from the then director Blair Foltz, who said, huh, I'd love to learn more about this forested swamp. Do you suppose we could, uh, you know, change the hydro, well, not change the hydrology, do you suppose we could excavate and find enough hydrology to, to create a vernal pool for our visitors to come and explore? And I looked at it, we did some soil tests, and um, we decided to give it a try. And in this case, some of the, uh, you know, basic conditions uh, were met. We had a forested margin. Uh, we had, we created some dry hummocks for trees to survive. Um, we have some, we created some deep holes in there. We had gradually sloped banks. And I'll show you how that, that uh, was developed. First and foremost, it's right here. This is where we'll be going Saturday morning. This is the Ossipee River. Um, and we're right near the state line. If you're on Route 25 headed towards uh, Gorham and Westbrook and Portland, and you get to the state line, you've gone just too far. Huntress Bridge Road is right there. You cross a bridge and the headquarters is right on your left. Um, so in this case, we again, we, we took a look at the swamp very carefully. I did some test holes. I found some good organic soils in there. I found a perched layer beneath, that is to say a hard pan layer that I knew would hold water up for a certain length of time in the summertime or springtime. Um, and this was the summer view of what was otherwise too shallow. It was three or four inches deep on the average, maybe six inches max. It had a lot of sensitive fern. It was more of a seepage uh, area that fed into an intermittent stream that went down to the Osby River. And so we got the permitting. We ran through the Army Corps, of course, talked to them about it. We talked to the state about it. Uh, we had the state come out and take a look at the site. They approved the permit. And this was the day that the day after the initial excavation, August 25th, 2016. And you can see again, we were creating purposefully creating some upland islands and some variable terrain. We left a bunch of rocks um, and tried to mimic natural conditions of a pool as much as possible. And this is what how it turned out. November 26th, the same year, it flooded nicely, it froze over. And uh, in the springtime, it held water perfectly. And the very first year, we ended up with all kinds of activity. Spotted salamanders, as depicted here, we had some wood frogs. These were already hatched. Uh, we had a bunch of aquatic invertebrates. And again, the, the, the water held nicely uh, and drains down. It, it does actually hold water year round at the very deepest part, but not in every year. Like 2021, it, it dried out completely, 2022. Uh, but this year, I'm sure it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna have water in it for a good long time. So that's what we're, uh, we're gonna take a look at. Um, I, I wanna thank the Tin Mountain for joining forces with Green Mountain to, to do this program. Um, the Harris Center for providing some data on their big night. Um, keep in mind that the state uh, is a partner in this amphibian and reptile conservation group, which is an east, eastern northeast regional group uh, that keeps tabs on vernal pools and certifies them in various states where they can be certified. Uh, Fish and Game Department and the Non-Game Endangered Species Division of that department is the one that is a partner and active in it. And they've got some really great, great programs um, that they offer. And of course, uh, online vernal pool forms you can fill out as a part of the uh, uh, reporting um, program that they do. So with that, um, I will entertain some questions if people have been and uh yeah hope to see many of you saturday all right rick thank you so much um it looks like um it looks like um a couple questions 
came in um, through the chat. Um, first being, do you know of any zoning ordinances that have good language to help protect vernal pools? Yeah, yeah, that's a really great question. So I, I didn't get into the, the nitty gritty of vernal pool conservation, but uh, largely because we're gonna talk quite a bit about that on Saturday. Um, that being said, we have both state and federal laws that regulate activities in wetlands, including vernal pools. And as many of you know, vernal pools are mostly wetland, but not always. You can have a dry pool that doesn't have hydric soils or sufficient vegetation to qualify it as a jurisdictional wetland in the eyes of the state or the federal government. Uh, that being said, my experience is that better than 95% of our vernal pools are wetland, at least in part. So that said, you, you need a permit to dredge or fill. Um, like I said, I get my permits from the feds and the state uh, to do that uh, job at, at, in Effingham. Um, and you can enhance that protection by a, a local zoning ordinance that recognizes and calls out vernal pools. We have several examples to provide. Hanover is one that I would quickly go to. Lebanon uh, also. And oh my gosh, there's several. Canterbury, I think, has a local ordinance that identifies vernal pools in their wetland section, the wetland section of the zoning ordinance. And what is uh, more common than not is that they provide not only protection locally, that is to say you have to have a special use permit to dredge or fill in a vernal pool, but they also provide a buffer to them, which the state and the federal government generally does not. The state definitively does not have a requirement to have to buffer a vernal pool, which can be a real problem if you're running a bunch of heavy equipment right next to it. But the feds tend to prefer that if you're going to actually touch a vernal pool, they then will require some type of buffer. Uh, and it's pretty expensive. Um, so um, I can, again, I'm going to talk more about that in the, um, in the, on Saturday, uh, but there are those regulations to keep in mind and, and ones that you can uh, use for your own town using the, a good example of some other towns. Um, and, and that sort of rolls into the next um, question being what state protection, what state level um, protections exist for yeah. vernal and wetlands? So, so we have a, a, a statewide Wetlands Protection Act that was enacted in 1969, and it recognizes that waters of the United States are state waters as well. Um, the definition is purposefully the same uh, for wetlands, um, uh, and that is uh, to facilitate the coordination of permitting impacts to wetlands between the federal government, in this case, the Army Corps of Engineers, and the state of New Hampshire. Uh, so those definitions are the same. Vernal pool definitions are almost the same. Uh, they're not quite the same. The state, um, got a little bit more, um, how shall I say, defined relative to secondary indicators, but the primary indicators are the same. If you have primary indicators, you have a vernal pool in the eyes of the state and the feds. Uh, in terms of uh, protections, um, you need a permit to impact a vernal pool. But like I said, on the state side, you don't have to have any kind of permit if you're going to impact grounds away from the vernal pool, that is to say within the buffer. Right. The only sort of protections there that you might come across is if you're disturbing more than 100,000 square feet of land, like stumping it for a field or something, um, then you need a permit for, um, for through the Alteration of Terrain Bureau. And therein lies some, some protections for indirect impacts to, um, to vernal pools. But otherwise, it's just a, you know, you don't need a permit if you're just impacting the area around it and not touching the pool. So I, I hope that helps or gets at some of it. It's pretty complicated, <laughs> to say the least. Um, and then there was, um, uh, Dolph was asking about the pond off the parking lot at um, Tin Mountains Nature Lake yeah, yeah. in Albany. Um, yes, Tom, that is um, that was a Doug that is created, um, and he says, is it a vernal pool? Yeah, 
Well, that's a really good question. So, so it meets all the criteria as far as I can tell. I know that spotted salamanders lay eggs in there. I'm not sure about wood frogs. Are they have they laid any eggs in there? You know, Nora. Or Tom? Um, I am not. Yes, definitely. Yes, wood frogs. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, good. Thanks, Lori. So, so then, you know, it has the water, it has the primary indicators, it doesn't have fish, it's isolated, it's a vernal pool. So effectively, you create a vernal pool. I don't know how productive it is. And I think we could, you know, there's things we could do to improve its productivity, um, you know, not the least of which would be to um, provide some shade. <laughs> hey, right. we've been, we've been yeah. working on that. We've put, yes. we've planted quite a few different shrubs and trees around. Great. Uh, yeah. Great. I mean, you know, and then another feature, which of course, as you all know, uh, from what I was just saying, uh, the complexity of life in a vernal pool typically requires organic material. And I know that was a gravel base sort of cobble sand gravel base thing. And organic material will aggregate over time and increase that biodiversity at the microorganismic level, which will increase the success of the species up the food chain. But right now it kind of lacks that. And I think there, <laughs> there's uh, probably a limitation there um, in terms of, you know, how much food those salamander and frog larvae have to eat. Good question though. All right, yes. Um, and if anyone else has um, any final questions for Rick, you are welcome to, you don't, you know, if you wanna just unmute yourself, you can ask it directly yeah. to him. Um, you don't have to be afraid of him. Um, otherwise, <laughs> I will plug, you know, I, I put in several times in the chat, but um, if you're interested in joining Rick and Green Mountain Conservation Group on Saturday for that vernal pool exploration, um, you can uh, you can get more information and register uh, by emailing Kara um, at education at gmcg.org. Um, Otherwise, Rick, thank you so much for another fabulous program. And hey, you here's, bet. To, here's you bet. to a great exploration on Saturday. Thanks, Nora. See y'all.